Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to introduce Professor Clayton Neil Lewis from University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, Clayton is in the computer science department there and um, has been working in, in the space of usability and accessibility with a special focus on users with cognitive disabilities. Um, I really like the type of work Clayton does because it sort of focuses on the user, which sort of is really aligned with the way we think of it at Google. Independent of accessibility, we typically focus on the user. And um, the nice thing about some of the projects that Clayton's been doing with some of the students is to look at platforms like Android and ask the question, what kinds of new solutions do these devices enable for a user with special needs? And notice that that's subtly different from asking the vanilla accessibility question of, you know, is there a screen reader on this thing that works? You know, does this application work with a screen reader? It's the broader question, which is, if you have a computer in your pocket and you have a special need, what can you do with that computer in order to meet that special need? So with that, I won't take any more of Clayton's time, and we'll let's maximize the time he has for his talk. Uh, take it away, Clayton. Thank you, Marlon. And thanks for the invitation. Let's keep this really informal. It's a small enough audience that we can definitely do that. And it's possible that some of the stuff I might race past would be things that you'd like to hear more about. So, so please uh, interrupt with questions or comments whenever uh, that, that seizes you. So I'll, I'll start with a little bit about cognitive disabilities. Uh, for some of you, it may be a new area. It's, it's a very diverse area. There are lots of ways that people can face challenges in cognitive functioning. Probably the best known uh, example of a cognitive disability is Down syndrome, which is in the category called developmental disability. So it's a chromosomal ab abnormality. There are a number of things like that. Uh, people are less aware that brain injury is a major contributor. So there are a lot of people who have cognitive limitations coming from auto accidents or from uh, uh, or from uh, sports injuries. Uh, stroke is a contributor. Alzheimer disease is getting a lot of publicity because of the aging of the population. Uh, and then actually perhaps the least uh, thought about category, which is there and is numerically uh, meaningful, is mental illness. So some mental illnesses have as a side effect impact on cognitive functioning. And the data aren't really good in this area, but an estimate that is kind of a consensus figure is that there are about 20 million people in the US. It's kind of anybody's guess what the numbers would be on a world basis. The, the, the data really aren't, aren't there. But uh, you know maybe 400 million might not be a bad guess, actually, on a, a world figures. So there are a lot of people that, that suffer from a condition. And sort of definitionally, suffering from it means that it has an impact on something you want to do in your daily life or your work life or whatever it might be. Technology is relevant to people with cognitive disabilities in a whole lot of ways. I've listed some of these here, communication aids, uh, task prompting. I'll say something about that. Uh, a good many people with cognitive disabilities are capable of performing some range of tasks, but they have trouble with what we systems people would call dispatching. So figuring out what to do when is often a challenge for people. So using technology to prompt people, to tell them when they need to be doing something is uh, is, is a, a common interest. Uh, mobility aids. Uh, many people with cognitive disabilities can't drive, so they are using public transportation, and public transportation is, is challenging uh, for them. If you imagine yourself trying to use the bus system in Jakarta, that's maybe roughly what using public transportation uh, on a daily basis is like for someone with a cognitive disability. That is, if everything goes perfectly, then your trip will be successful, but unfortunately, there are a lot of things that could go wrong. And using technology to help with that is, is an area people are interested in. Uh, Service-oriented architectures. This is the, the OnStar kind of model. There's interest in harnessing a portfolio of services through a techno technological infrastructure to give people access to assistance and information as they might need it. Uh, text simplification. We actually have a, it's not the focus of this talk, but my colleague Jim Martin and I have a small grant from uh, Google that we're very grateful for that's allowing us to do some work looking at automatic ways of simplifying text. User interface harmonization relates to the fact that for people with cognitive disabilities, having to deal with uh, novel interfaces is an additional challenge. So finding ways to present 
uh, interfaces using uh, known and familiar kinds of elements uh, is important. And there are a lot of other things, too. These are, these are just a few representative uh, examples. So as Raman mentioned, we've been focusing uh, since November quite a lot of effort on the Android uh, platform, which we're very excited about. And I've listed here some of the potential advantages of Android for people with cognitive disabilities. And you'll perceive that many of these advantages apply to lots of other people as well, starting with low cost and portability. But I'll just note that the economics of disability, to call it that, are, are not good. So the employment rate for people with disabilities is low. Uh, income levels are low. And so there's a lot of technology that you could say is in principle available to people, but in practice it's not. So cost itself is something that's really important. And of course, portability is important as well. Another thing that uh, we've uh, zeroed in on in a number of the projects that I'll be describing is uh, remote configuration and management. And this is especially important with respect to user independence. And user independence is, in turn, especially important for people with cognitive disabilities. So uh, if, you, if you talk to people with cognitive disabilities, this, this is really at the top of the list. What they are interested in is technology that will allow them to live more independently. They, they really do not like being in the situation as they all too often are of having to rely on other people to do things. So being able to manage things and provide supports remotely uh, is, is a key benefit. Uh, Location-aware services, such as the Google, uh, Android uh, platform makes available, is also something that has value. A uh, couple of things I'm mentioning there, safety monitoring. So I mentioned problems with public transportation. Sadly, it's uh, an everyday occurrence that someone with a cognitive disability becomes lost in the public transportation system. And and this has a number of sort of bad follow-on effects. Again, very sadly, in our society, uh, people with cognitive disabilities are very vulnerable to being exploited in a whole variety of awful ways. And so being lost is not just a matter of an inconvenience. It has a safety aspect to it. So uh, the prospect of technology that uh, helps people to uh, discover when they're not where they need to be, allow them to communicate with people when they're in that situation, allow other people potentially to detect that on their behalf. All these things are of interest. And then uh, location-based prompting that relates to the dispatching thing. So there's interest in making it possible for someone to be reminded of what they need to do when they arrive at work, for example. Uh, some of you might know or you might not that uh, many people with cognitive disabilities would work in a setting where they have someone playing a role called job coach. And the job coach has the job uh, of reminding someone as needed of when they need to do things. If you think back to that independence point that I made, if someone can be reminded without having to have a person remind them, that's something that's a real, real plus. So, so these are some potential benefits of, of, uh, of Android. We also think the openness of Android itself and also the open service concept that Google has been promoting uh, around Android, uh, we think these things are also really important. And that's why th these are equally important as the technical features in the fact that we're putting a focus in this area. So uh, allowing people to choose their handset and choose the configuration of their software with, without having to uh, bow down to the carriers uh, is, is really key. In, in this area because the, what people need is, is really diverse. So making it possible for people to uh, have, a, a, a wide, uh, have wide flexibility in what they're going to have is really important. And then something else that we think is strategically important is that uh, there's, there's some precedent in, in other areas of, of inclusive technology. And I mentioned here GNOME and the Orca system. These are, these are open source uh, accessibility kinds of projects. Uh, and, and they provide some precedent for the notion that open source really can harness uh, some, some resources in this area that the traditional commercial model has more trouble mobilizing. I'm personally uh, very interested in, in harnessing the efforts of students. Um, I'm at a university, but uh, probably all of you know that all over the world, there are students who need to be doing and are doing uh, significant uh, project work in their, in their curricula. Uh, and so tapping that resource is something which I think has a, has a lot of strategic potential. And I think the openness of Android makes it a good candidate for mobilizing a lot of uh, useful effort. 
So I wanted to describe our early Android experience. We organized a class that ran this spring semester. Actually, one thing that was very interesting to me was that we didn't get the class organized until after people had already registered for their spring classes, but nevertheless, we had no trouble getting as many students as we wanted into that class. So the platform is very attractive to students, and the idea of, of developing applications relevant to uh, people with cognitive disabilities was something that was attractive to students. Uh, so we did a uh, variety. I guess I've, I've listed uh, five projects. I'll go into detail on a few of them. If you're curious about others, I can tell you more about them. But just going through the high level uh, headings, so there was a project, the focus of which was location-aware prompting, something I mentioned a minute ago. Another one that I'll tell you a little bit more about is remotely managed uh, scheduling and, and prompting. I'll come back and say more about that. Uh, uh, then a, th a third project provides naming practice for people with aphasia. So aphasia is a, a language disorder commonly associated with stroke. And one of the effects of it is that you may lose the ability to name familiar objects. So you can recognize the objects, but you can't come up with the names for them. It's a real bad condition. There's not a real good prognosis usually for this, but something that is of some value is uh, getting naming practice, basically a flashcard kind of a thing. Uh, not a very sophisticated application, but Android makes it possible to do this in a portable platform, whereas today people have to go to a therapist's office for this. But another key point in the Android uh, prototype uh, is that uh, there's the potential for remote management uh, by a clinician. And I'll describe more of that more. There was another project uh, which was a public transportation and navigation aid, and then an API project, which was kind of down a level. Uh, an API for doing multimedia buttons, so making it easier for somebody to create buttons with pictures on them, sounds associated with them, and the like. So that's kind of an overview of the project. I'll give you some of the details here. So we, we submitted actually all of these projects to the developer challenge. Uh, none of these projects won, but I'm happy to say that actually one of the students in the class was a winner. And I don't know how many of you followed that developer challenge, but those are pretty good odds. So one of our students was one of 50 winners out of more than 1,700 applications. Uh, but he was a winner for an individual project that he did, not, not uh, the, the project that he participated in the class. But what I'm showing here is a comic strip that the students use to kind of convey to someone quickly what the point of this particular application is. So this is the, the uh, comic strip for the aphasia naming uh, program and, and what it uh, develops is that uh, there's a, a person who needs to do the naming practice. He's working with a therapist. The therapist can configure the naming practice on the client's Android by, uh, by essentially uploading particular decks of these kind of flashcard-like things. And, and one of the things that's of interest here is that you can actually do this without requiring speech recognition. You might think, well, how's, how are you going to score the, uh, you know, whether someone is naming the thing correctly? Well, it turns out people can self-score adequately on this kind of thing. They can tell whether they've succeeded in getting the thing right or not. Another thing that goes beyond just the simple flashcard idea that's described in the uh, comic strip, or at least alluded to here, is that uh, there are, are, are kind of clues that form part of the therapeutic practice. So you may not be able at all to come up with the name of something just given the picture. But if you're given the first syllable, that may enable you to kind of get over the hump and come up with the word. And so the practice is a little more than just running through a deck and seeing how many things you can name. It has to do with what clues are needed to allow you to name the thing, and then fading those clues. So there are a few levels of management that the clinician would go through using something like this. And key advantage of Android for this is that that management can take place remotely. So instead of having to go into the therapist's or clinician's office and have all this stuff done, uh, the clinician can, uh, can monitor what your success rate is. For that matter, can monitor whether you're practicing the amount that you're supposed to be so that they can offer some encouragement if, if you're not doing that. Uh, but then they can adjust the various parameters of the practice process, including swapping in new practice materials. So this is one in particular that we put in the low-hanging fruit category. I should have mentioned my colleague, Gail Ramsberger, who's an aphasiologist that 
really worked with the students to develop this one. And as I'll say more about this later, but uh, we're hoping this summer to kind of really finish this off and get it ready for deployment as soon as the Android phones start appearing. We think this is a, a pretty certain winner. Uh, the other project that I'll take you through in a little bit of detail is the uh, remotely manageable uh, prompting and reminder uh, system. And this is the comic strip for that one that shows Ron and uh, Ron's caregiver, Norma. So there's been actually quite a bit of progress recently, a lot of interest that's developed in the kind of world of cognitive disabilities in using handheld uh, scheduling uh, technology. So it's been kind of an interesting evolution with some interesting things about how people have kind of come around to recognizing the value of that sort of thing. It's, it's not widely used now. It's something that really needs to be promoted. And that's one of the reasons we're interested in this. We think that uh, if, if uh, Android is successful uh, in delivering and all the things we talked about before, that it'll make it much easier for people to kind of promote this practice for people who need it. But as with the uh, naming practice thing, it's really key that you have the potential for doing remote management. So what the students set up was something that integrates with Google Calendar. So caregiver goes to Google Calendar. They can do that from wherever they are on the web. Uh, obviously, that's just a web application. Uh, uh, so Norma can go on and set up whatever she wants to for Ron's schedule. So uh, she, can, she can manage the schedule for Ron, uh, either you know, sort of standing things or reminders for ad hoc things or whatever uh, is, is needed there. And, and then the reminder material uh, gets pushed to Ron's phone. So as I mentioned before, this really hits the theme of independence. Because this kind of thing, as I mentioned, it's not being done very much today. But to the extent it is being done, it's, it's really done based on sort of face-to-face, handoff kind of contact. So uh, Norma has to get physical possession of, uh, of Ron's device to, to work with it. And that's a drag from all, all kinds of uh, viewpoints. So make it possible for Norma to just work through a web interface and Ron not having to do the handoff with, with Norma is potentially a big win in this, in this uh, space. And uh, you see a little bit more of the. Uh, of the prototype in this uh, comic strip, starting with uh, working through Google Calendar. And then uh, this particular thing can deliver uh, pictorial prompts to Ron on the Android. And also, can there's a facility for, for Ron working on his Android to actually check something off as having been accomplished and, and that sort of thing. So this is another application that we have, uh, we have high hopes for. So, uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, there are some things that we would like to see happen. And actually, I'm, I'm uh, going to be going to the Google I.O. sessions over the next couple of days. And, and I hope to be getting in touch with people in the Android world to understand some of these things uh, better. But I'll just describe uh, some of the things we see as opportunities here. So uh, this, this first point has to do with, with routing sound over the phone side of the device. And this is not something that was needed in any of the applications the students actually developed. But we do have another project we've been working on, which is to allow a person who, who uses a computer application to speak to be able to uh, carry on their side of a telephone conversation. So the uh, this is kind of a, a merger between a smartphone and something called an AAC, which is Augmentative and Alternative Communication Device. Uh, actually, how many people have seen Stephen Hawking and his speaking device? So most people have. So Hawking has a motor disorder, ALS. But there are many people with cognitive disabilities who also have difficulty speaking. And, and some of these people. Uh, use devices where they basically press pictorial buttons to either make complete utterances like greetings or uh, in some cases they're able to kind of assemble a more complex utterance out of parts using pictorial selection. Well, we've been working actually with uh, support from Nokia and from a, a small assistive technology company called Saltillo 
to make it possible for someone using one of these devices to uh, place a phone call. And our, our current implementation has a kludge that involves wires and a bunch of other things you would like not to have. And one might think at first blush that something like Android that has certainly the processor that could run this, you know, press the button to speak kind of a thing and also has a phone on it would be a natural for this. But at least as far as we've been able to penetrate on Android, but also on other phones that we've looked at, there's really a separation between the phone side of the house, to call it that, and the computer side of the house, which actually doesn't make it easy to do this. And I'd like to understand why that is and what the prognosis might be for doing better uh, on that. Uh, another thing that, that uh, we are interested in, and, and this is not something, I think, which really has any sort of hardware dependency, if indeed some of the phone issues turn out to have those dependencies. This is really more of a, of a kind of software architecture dependency, but something that I think is strategic. It's also something really in common with much of what we're talking about. It's strategic for all kinds of, of people. And, and that is support for really simple selection and configuration of functional features. So if you talk to people in the cell phone world about cell phone marketing, there are any number of studies that make two points very clearly. So one point is that everybody says they wish they had a simpler phone. OK, so it's easy to document that. It's equally easy to document that no one will buy a simplified phone. OK, so this is a huge dilemma for, for people in the business. But it seems that if there is a way that where at least one could have some optimism about breaking that dilemma, and that would go like this. Suppose when you buy your phone, it comes with a basic set of features, which in fact, there's reason to think most people would be really happy with. But on the box, there are the 7,000 other features that it would be trivial for you to put on your phone. The difference is they're not there to begin with. Okay? So if you don't actually want the 7,000 features, you're not having your life cluttered up by them, but you're not either having to say, well, I've given up on these 7,000 features. But to make that work, it has to be really easy to add any feature that you want of, of these 7,000 to your, to your phone. So this is, a, this is a sort of standard consumer kind of play. Uh, this is a little more of a serious issue, you could argue, if you're somebody with cognitive limitations. Because I mean, one of the ways to think about that situation is that things which are kind of an annoyance, maybe, for the people in this room, that can be kind of much more than annoyance and really getting to the disaster stage for someone for whom dealing with complexity can be an additional challenge. So the stakes are higher in being able to, to uh, choose or have configured for you, depending on the situation, a set of features that's really well tailored to your uh, needs. So uh, to us, this is, a, this is a strategic area to uh, to push as Android develops is to you know, do whatever we can, working with other people to get it so that as Android emerges, it really has this flavor that it's really easy to add stuff. So one scenario that would be great if it can be realized is that uh, Raman and I are people with cognitive disabilities, and one of the things that may be a part of our lives is that we meet once a year at a summer camp. So there, there's a whole lot behind what I just said, but about you know, social arrangements for people with cognitive disabilities, the rest of it. But anyway, the reality is, or a positive reality actually is, that, that many people with disabilities do meet friends on a, an occasional um, uh, basis. And wouldn't it be great if, when I meet Raman at our, this, the session we have together at camp, that Raman shows me this great thing that he's got on his phone. And then that there's something really easy we can do at the level of knocking our phones together and when we do that, then I've got what Raman had on his phone. And of course, there doesn't have to be any phone-to-phone -phone transfer involved in that. There just has to be an informational transaction where you know, the fact that there's a particular feature that's on Raman's phone that, that I want, that, you know, that, that gets in, uh, installed. So making these things possible is something that's, that's strategic. Another piece of this is it would be good to have profile-based configuration for this stuff. Uh, a little more background. Uh, probably I, as a person with cognitive disabilities, might have some challenges dealing with a complex configuration process. But also, 
the people who support me, a caseworker who works with me, a family member who works with me, those people also are not likely to be technically highly sophisticated. So a configuration process that requires technical sophistication is, is not really on. And one of the directions that people have identified and been working towards in this space is making it possible for people to have a profile description that gets created that could require some level of relatively specialized consultation. But once that profile is available, then the selection and configuration of new features might be made easier by, uh, by use of that profile information. There's something that's been developing called the Access for All Schema that uh, is emerging in the web space that is uh, an approach to this kind of thing. And extending this kind of idea into the mobile space, we think, is likely to be important as well. So these are developments we're interested in and hope to be able to work with others, others on. So uh, we've also got, from these projects that students worked on, we've got a good deal of of kind of feedback experience on the Android platform as it now exists. And I've put up a few examples there. So there are issues around making it possible for one application to control other applications. So when you think about some of these remote configuration and management kinds of things, these are the sorts of things you'd like to be able to do. And in the platform as it is now, it doesn't appear easy to do that. Actually, I'm curious, how many of you have messed around at all with the Android platform? Any of you? OK. So some of these things you may recognize. So there's this SQL Lite, or however it's pronounced, uh, that's on there as the kind of database kind of things. And our students were very much aware of the Lite part of that and uh, you know, expressed a good level of frustration that there were things that they're used to finding it easy to do with databases that you can't really do with the, the thing that's on there. Uh, a number of the applications that I describe involve pushing things onto the phone. And the students were ingenious in finding ways to make that work. But they felt that these things were awkward and that it would be good if there were more direct ways of, of doing uh, some of them. Uh, those, that's sort of some of the, uh, the grumbling. Uh, on the other hand, there were a few people in the class that have experience doing phone development on other platforms, in particular WinCE and Symbian. And uh, they were very emphatic that they felt the development for Android was, was easier than what they were used to on those other platforms. That's definitely good news. Another thing I'll, I'll mention that came out very well, and, and we believe you know, not really by accident, uh, integration with, with uh, existing Google services uh, turned out to work really well. So I mentioned the Google Calendar thing. I didn't mention it, but two other projects, which I didn't really give you a description of, the location-aware prompting one and uh, the transportation aid made heavy use of other Google services. And that, that went uh, really well. Then a, a kind of a meta comment about this feedback, and one of the reasons why the feedback really needs a lot of processing and digestion, it's really hard to separate the state of the emulator, to call it that, from what the asymptotic state of Android would be. Okay, So some of that stuff's obvious, right? So there, there are things which are in the plan which aren't on the emulator, so that's kind of clear enough. But, but then there's stuff that isn't on the emulator, but you don't really know whether the intention is that it would never be part of Android or whether it's just sort of been left out temporarily or whatever. So, so sort of knowing the significance of various limitations is, is a little hard at, at this point. And uh, so being involved in a, uh, in a conversation with, with others about this kind of feedback would be very useful. So my last sort of bullet there is you know, where to go with this kind of information as the Android community develops. So another comment there. So the commitment of, for Android is that it would be an open source kind of thing. But it, it really isn't yet. Stuff isn't open. And it's, it's a little unclear to us, at least, you know, what the thinking is about really developing that, uh, that community. But as that community develops, presuming that it does, it's something we hope to, to participate in. So in terms of uh, immediate uh, follow-up, uh, this summer, with support from the National Science Foundation and through our participation in something called the Alliance for Advancing African American Researchers in Computing, I'll have uh, three undergraduates from Jackson State University working with me 
in Boulder. And, and the intent is to uh, pick up especially the more promising of the projects that I described to you, which would, will be the naming aid, uh, working with my uh, colleague Gail Ramsberger, the physiologist, and then the, the Google Calendar integration to really do what we can to kind of get those things uh, fully ready to go. That's something we're going to be, uh, we're going to be working on this summer. Uh, there's also another student staying at Jackson State who's a master's student who's, uh, who's planning to work with us on this. As I was telling uh, Raman, one of the things that's uh, potential for her as a project is working on text-to-speech. So text-to-speech is one of those kind of areas of ambiguity, the way things are now. So on the one hand, uh, it seems clear to us that there's a lot of really good things you could do with text-to-speech if you had it, uh, A. B, it's in the plan. C, it's not really happening. You know, so, so where that really stands and, and you know, whether it would be useful for somebody sort of in the outer circle to do some work there and sort of explore it is, is something that's, uh, that's of, of interest uh, to us. Raman and I were discussing over lunch that um, one of the things about student projects in a space like this is that since the main objectives of these projects are educational for the students, then as long as everybody goes into it with, with kind of uh, you know, a clear idea of, of what they're setting out to do, it can, it can work for students to sort of do some th what might turn out in the end to be throwaway effort if it accomplishes something in making clear what can be done, what some of the opportunities might be, smoking out some of the issues and the like. So this potential project this summer by the master students is in a way sort of under the shadow of, well, is it going to turn out that you know, the, the adults are going to just do text-to-speech? Well, OK, if they do, great. But uh, maybe there's room for a student project to do some path breaking, you know, bearing in mind that the point of the project and the student is really the educational uh, contribution that, that that could make. So I'm excited about the interaction with, uh, with, with Jackson State as a way of continuing this. Actually, it's not on the slide, but I'll mention something else that this is feeding into. We're, like many other places, uh, led by Georgia Tech. We're doing some serious restructuring of our computer science program and introducing a track structure. And uh, part of this track that I'm associated primarily with, which we've labeled digital and social systems, is a new class that I have high hopes for, which we're calling the DSS professional development class. And the idea of this class is to make room in the curriculum <laughs> for stuff that is really important for students to do, but traditionally isn't in the curriculum. So uh, I became aware over the last few years of an interesting category of student who would be in class and, and had many signs of being a very capable and uh, committed student, but at other signs of, of being a serious slacker. So sort of contradiction there. And, and in talking with these students about the circumstances, I learned actually in two different cases something like this, basically the same story. They're saying, well, in, in one case, someone's saying, well, you know, I'm really putting a lot of time into my participation in the Pearl 3 development. And so every week, I'm kind of deciding, you know, OK, so do I put more time into Pearl 3, or do I do what Clayton wants me to do in the Gamelet Design for Education course? And frankly, I decided that what I'm doing for Pearl 3 is more important. Well, and in those conversations, I ended up feeling, yeah, you're right. That is more important. So it's rational for you to kind of do the minimum uh, in some of these demands. But then stepping back from that, I realized that we were putting our students in in a wrong position. That is, we were forcing them to choose between the sort of traditional stick in the mud stuff that's in the traditional curriculum and really being involved and figuring out what's happening in the world and becoming known and so on. So like the guy who, who was working on Pearl 3 is actually taking time out to the program. He's going over to Brussels and work on a really cool, you know, invent the next programming language that's going to revolutionize the world kind of project. So you know, a really great opportunity that he got really through the, the visibility that he gained through his open source activity. So the idea of this professional development class 
is to recognize that things like participating in open source are, are things that we should be encouraging our students to do and supporting them in doing, not telling them, oh, you've got to choose between doing these things and, and doing the stuff that your traditional classes uh, ask you to do. There's, there's a long list of other stuff. The course has a, a portfolio uh, sort of structure to it. And the notion isn't that, that everybody does everything that's kind of called out in the portfolio, but that everybody at least becomes aware of these things as things that might represent opportunities for them, because that's another reflection that comes from kind of stepping back. So our kind of uh, let it happen on the margins kind of approach had the effect that many of our students weren't doing these things because they didn't think they needed to because they weren't part of the curriculum, which is another sort of mal-communication built around this kind of traditional thing. Anyway, uh, I'm hoping that after the summer, carrying on our Android activity will happen, uh, for some students at least, in the context of this course, because participating in open source activities is one of the things that that course framework is, is intended to uh, encourage. So for as long as uh, Android is ticking over, which I hope will be for the indefinite future, we, we intend to follow up our, our participation. So some acknowledgments here. Uh, so the Coleman Institute at the University of Colorado, Coleman Institute for Cognitive Disabilities, has been supporting my involvement. Uh, also, in addition to participating in this institute that we have, uh, I'm also a member of something called the Mouthful Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center for Advancing Cognitive Technologies. Some of you may know that these RERCs, of which there are roughly 20, are pretty big, roughly $5 million uh, research centers uh, funded by the National Institute for Disabilities and Rehabilitation Research. And, and RERC Act is the only one ever of these centers that has a focus specifically on the needs of people with cognitive disabilities. And that uh, center also has been supporting uh, some of my work. And, and I've listed here the students who have uh, who participated in the Android course. The column on the left is the undergrads, and the column on the right is the, uh, the grads. So there are a few more undergrad, well, one more undergrad than, uh, than grads. So we had a, a good cast of characters uh, for this. Uh, then this is the, the uh, contact slide. So that's my email, clayton.lewis at colorado.edu. And I want to say a few words about a couple of Google groups that are here in case some of you might have an interest. So uh, actually starting with the second one I've listed there, inclusive developments for, uh, for Android. So uh, I've not been publicizing this site, and I don't intend to. Uh, but for those that are interested in, in working on uh, inclusive technology for Android uh, in the spirit of exchanging information and mutual assistance and the like. I'd say there may be something like 15 people so far uh, that I've invited into this. It's not been very active uh, so far, but my intention is, especially as now that we've got more experience under our belt and there may be other people who have been participating who have some project work, but the idea is I'm hoping that, as I said, we can do some mutual uh, assistance there. Uh, but as I said, I'm, I'm, I haven't publicized it. Uh, you know, the, the spirit is that we want the work to kind of speak for itself. And if this community kind of helps us get some good work done, great. But it's really the work that we want to have come out from the group rather than the group itself. But anyway, if any of you are interested in potentially participating in that, if you drop me a note, I'm happy to uh, make that possible. And then I wanted to mention something else, uh, not directly related to Android, but another activity that I'm involved in, in case maybe, again, some of you might have an interest in this. And there's a little bit of a story uh, behind this, which some of you may be aware of, but others may not. So uh, probably you all know about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines coming from W3C. Uh, the WCAG 1.0 guidelines have been out for several years, and just now, the WCAG 2.0 revised guidelines are issuing. And from the perspective of people with cognitive disabilities, there's been kind of a big deal going on there. Uh, there so there's, a, there's been a collision of good intentions, one could say. So one good intention uh, has been, well, let's, uh, let's uh, 
try to promote the idea that it, there are things people could do to make put stuff they put on the web uh, more readily usable by people with cognitive limitations. So that's a good intention. So, but another good intention was this. Let's increase the compliance with these guidelines by making them more objective. So the people who run the guidelines production process felt that compliance with the 1.0 guidelines was poor because there was no controversy that it was poor. But there was a belief, there is a belief, that one contributing factor to compliance being poor was that some of the 1.0 guidelines were wishy-washy and hard to pin down. And so people would say, well, I'm not going to, uh, I can't argue that my company should comply to these guidelines because they're too vague and you can't tell whether you complied anyway. Well, right in the middle of that vagueness was a guideline, I'm not going to quote the exact words, but it was a guideline which said, uh, use the simplest and clearest language appropriate to commu your communicative aims. Well, that's wishy-washy. A little bit of an aside there. Some of you might be thinking, well, come on. I think I could write a guideline for simple and plain language. I'd use one of these grade level formulae. Uh, well, if, you're, if you'd be tempted to think that way, that's, that's really not, as it turns out, a very productive way to think about it. I don't know how many of you may know Ginny Reddish, but Ginny is a person that's done a lot of work in, in this area and has written about it and makes some very persuasive arguments, of which I'll just mention two. So one is, if you look at the kinds of stuff that people really put on the web on the one hand, and you look at these readability measures on the other hand, they just don't fit. So the readability measures are based on the notion that what you're looking at is running text. Well, very little of what's on the web is running text. What's on the web is bulleted lists and stuff like that. So the formulae just don't get off the ground for that kind of material. Second point is a little more technical and also interesting. These these readability measures work pretty well if you have naturally occurring text and you want to estimate relative readability or relative comprehensibility. The, the readability, these readability measures actually do pretty well in that setting. They don't work, however, in the setting where you say, OK, I've got my naturally occurring text and it doesn't score very well. I need to increase my score. The kinds of things that you do to increase your score probably actually make the passage less comprehensible. So the things you do to, to increase your score are things like take a complex sentence and chop it up into its constituent short sentences. Well, when you do that, you toss the semantics that really said what these sentences had to do with each other, which is in the conjunctions and stuff like that. So, so these readability scores don't work as a way of sort of operationalizing the notion of, of you know, simple and clear language. So in the WCAG 2 guidelines, that guideline is gone. So one of the consequences of that is the following, that I could have a site which offers some important service or some important information, and I could deliberately obfuscate it. And under the, the new guidelines, there's basically nothing to say about that because you know, using simple language is sort of gone from the scene. Well, a, a number of people with cognitive disabilities and their advocates weighed in in this revision process and complained and actually lodged a formal complaint, which is kind of a big deal in this, in this world. Uh, and, and there were some sort of changes of language and a few other things. But basically, when the dust settled, uh, the, the uh, uh, the use of simple and clear language is kind of gone from the, the scene. And I've been charged with working with people who are interested to draft a kind of a supplement to the guidelines which would say, OK, if you're interested in making what you put on the web easier for people to understand, these are the things you ought to do. So I've got another uh, Google group that's directed at this drafting process, and there's a cast of characters there. But if any of you are, are interested in this, especially if any of you would say, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got some experience in this area, I would be interested in helping to uh, draft that. Again, if you send me an email note, I'd be, I'd be delighted to invite you into that, uh, into that group. 
So I will stop there. Nobody interrupted me, which is not a good sign. But uh, maybe you've been holding questions or, or comments until now, in which case, now's your chance. Yeah? So you spoke a little bit about uh, the adaptive applications that could be on a system to allow you to configure what protocols. But what about the interface? I mean, what about combining the work of uh, Christoph, I can't remember his last name, from University of Washington, who did the adaptive interfaces and applying that kind of technique to yeah, something great. like Android? Great idea. Yeah, I didn't mean to say that. So actually, the, uh, uh, the video people reminded me to repeat the question. So the question is, I talked about adaptive uh, selection of applications, what about adaptation of the interface? And I didn't mean to, to separate those two. Those things you know, clearly need to, to, uh, uh, to go uh, together. So you know, strategically, a trend that's, that's happening for lots of reasons, most not having to do particularly with inclusion, uh, you know, separating semantics from presentation is sort of proceeding apace. And, and that opens up lots of room for doing good things in the way of allowing people to express and have honored their information presentation preferences, of, of which there are a lot. And, and you alluded to Christoph Gajos's work, and for those that don't know that, that's really great work at University of Washington for dealing with uh, you know, fairly mundane kinds of preferences having to do with, I've got a little teeny screen. That's where I want stuff presented. Uh, please uh, recast information to make it work there. And Gajos's work also uh, brings in things like you can express preferences having to do with the degree of motor control that you have so that things like pointing targets can be adapted and the like. So there's some, there's some great stuff there. But yeah, I agree. And you're, are you Josh? Do I recognize you? Yeah. Good. Yeah, so Josh is, is absolutely right. I mean, I, and I didn't intend to say, well, there's applications and interfaces happen separately. It's really the whole ball of wax so that uh, somebody could uh, you know, again, notionally create a, a, a profile in which they can express these kinds of, of preferences. I'll mention another one which, which sort of didn't come up along the way, but, but, but is really important. Uh, so uh, many people with, with cognitive abilities, including people with aphasia, but other conditions as well, just, just have trouble with, with reading. And actually, I don't know, you know, here at Google, maybe you some of you, anyway, spend time kind of watching people using the web and using search results. But it's, it's very striking if you do that, especially if you do it with, with someone who does have some cognitive challenges or reading challenges, which can have a variety of, of origins. It really brings out how uh, reliant we are as users of the web on very rapid filtering of text. And if you sit with somebody for whom rapid filtering of text is not on, it, it, you really get a completely different look at the, uh, at the experience. And it makes you think about all kinds of things which, which otherwise maybe you don't think about. Like, uh, gee, what about, and actually some of these things overlap with, with things that uh, people who use screen readers want to have. The ability to have a view of something which looks only at headings, for example. Uh, these things are, are, are really important. So this is another dimension of user preference. So if somebody could say, look, you know, when, when stuff's presented to me, I, I really want to see a view in which what I'm just seeing is the major headings, and I want to have the ability then to expand a major heading if I want to, but I don't want to have to pick out the major headings like, from a background of, of miscellaneous text. Actually, a, a point that uh, some of you may have thought about, because it often comes up here, uh, there's the, the question arises sometimes, so could you have a way of presenting information that would sort of be good for everybody? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, you know, people just have different information needs. And so rather than thinking in terms of some single presentation that's going to work for everybody, what you need to be thinking about is really making presentation flexible so that people can express what their needs are. And, and use the technology to, uh, to honor those things. And I say one dimension of that is, so for someone who is a typical reader, having a cluttered screen, contrary to a lot of design advice, under, you know, sort of under many circumstances, having a cluttered screen is actively good for good readers. Because it saves, 
having to do a lot of guessing about where the information is that you want to have. The more stuff you can put on that one screen, the more likely it is that you can find the thing that you're looking for right there with having to go to other screens, which in turn involves having guessing what other screen you want to go to. So for people who are good readers, packing as much stuff onto the screen as possible, that's a win. But for lots of other people, for all kinds of reasons, it isn't a win. And so you really need to move to a world where people can specify, OK, I want to have this kind of presentation and, and have content delivered in a way that allows that, that kind of uh, selection. So yeah, the UI is definitely something that needs to be in the mix for, for adaptation and configuration. Other questions, comments, thoughts from anybody? Um, so quick comment on what you said there at the end in yeah. terms of uh, needing to sort of have the user specify how he wants to see that information. At the, at the time, the work on CSS, and specifically CSS 1.4 was done in the 95, 96 time frame. A lot of us who scared about this issue spent a lot of time hammering on the C of CSS because it is cascaded. Uh -huh. and the publisher doesn't have the final say on what it looks like. Yeah. The user needs to have a say. Yep. What is unfortunate is two things that are unfortunate. One, there have been no user level tools for users to control the CSS. And yep. uh, sad to say, the so-called adaptive technology slash accessibility community hasn't really picked up on the yep. use of CSS as a user level tool. Yeah. And done um, that. So like a lot of the things that you're talking about for a community, you know, for somebody who say wants to be able to quickly see the headlines and then selectively expand things could yeah. be done very cleanly if you have yeah. user-level control on CSS. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. And, and actually, actually, something I didn't include on this contact slide, but if, if, if any of you are interested, uh, let me know about this as well. Uh, so I'm hoping to get uh, some people from Google to participate in one or two workshops that we're having this fall. So one is actually on mobile technology, and the idea is to do some strategic thinking about what the opportunities are. And the other one uh, focuses on the web. And uh, uh, one of the things that's emerging for us as we try to plan that in terms of you know who needs to do what to really accomplish some good stuff here, it does seem as if the user agent side of things is, is kind of lagging. At least this, this is my sense of somebody that's not on the inside. Maybe there's stuff going on there that I'm not aware of. but. Uh, but uh, I agree with you. That really needs to uh, to, uh, to to see some uh, emphasis. Uh, and that reminds me, I was talking with with Charles uh, about some of his work, and uh, maybe everyone here has uh, seen that. But um, in the world of of screen readers, when you say screen reader, people think, oh, you've got a user who's blind. Well, there are many people who either are or would like to be screen readers who are not blind, uh, but they have other uh, challenges connected with, with reading. And, and the way they need to control the process is, is quite different. And some of Charles's work, I think, is, is showing some really good uh, directions there. So yeah, there's a lot that, that, uh, that can be done and, and needs to be done on, on, on that side of things. Any thoughts from anybody? Yeah. So one aspect of cell phone technology that is rapidly changing is the physical interface. Um, specifically, if you look at something like the iPhone or other similar phones which are using touch interfaces, yeah. um, that poses a lot of questions for users who have to then deal with a uh, interaction model, which is in uh, confined to a fixed set of buttons, so that they always know yeah. that they have to press. So, yeah. do you have an opinion? On yeah. So this? the question has to do with uh, the impact of uh, you know relatively new technologies, in particular uh, touchscreen, multi-touch kinds of things. So I, I don't have the model number, and I may even be garbling the higher order term, but I th I think it's it's Docomo. Uh, well. If I'm right that it's Docomo, anyway, one of the major uh, Japanese vendors has a line of phones that's uh, that's aimed at users with challenges, including uh, uh, people who are aging. And little note on that: 
talking with people in the cell phone business, it's really interesting. So on the one hand, people are drawn to the growing population of aging users. But on the other hand, actually more so, most vendors are scared at the prospect of being linked in the general consumer consciousness with aging users. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Docomo, I think it is, has, has, has been doing some development in that area. And one of the things I've gotten, I've not actually seen this, but I've been reading about it and heard one presentation that referred to it. Apparently, they've got technology that allows somehow the mechanical feel of the touchscreen to be reconfigured so that it plays like a touchscreen. It's reconfigurable. You can format it as one big button or three pretty big buttons or nine smaller buttons and so on. But going along with that is apparently tactile feedback. Now, what the character of that tactile feedback, I don't know, is I don't know. So I don't know whether you can feel the outlines of the buttons or whether it's the sort of force feedback that's configured or, or what. But, um, but there, there is some, um, uh, you know, there is some, uh, some, some progress uh, there. It's interesting to hear you say that because I've always maintained that a good touchscreen interface will not work for a user, will work much better for a user who can see if there is tactile force feedback coming from it. So yeah. I wouldn't yeah. immediately assume though that might be the case today with the iPhone that a touchscreen is necessarily bad for a blind user. If you actually do it right, uh -huh. I, I believe, because at the end of the day, the user who can see is also going to need to use the landing in the dark. Yeah, and um, you know, if you have some force feedback, I think the, it makes the yeah. whole experience more realistic. Because in the real world, yeah. when you push buttons, yeah. you hear a slight sound. I mean, otherwise, buttons don't feel like buttons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. No, I didn't mean to say that this, these features wouldn't be of benefit to yeah. uh, to others. But I've been interested to see that coming along, and I should I should dig in and try to find out more about it, and particularly find out whether there's. It's, it's tactile in the sense that there's something you actually can feel without engaging the buttons or, or what. Something that, um, uh, you know, I mentioned the, very briefly the API for multimedia buttons. And, and one of the things that was explored a little bit in that project, and, and then I, I'm aware that there's a little bit of work on this, is uh, speaking buttons. So uh, you can imagine something where as you pass your fingers over the touch screen, you actually get some auditory feedback, which could give you an idea of what the buttons are and what functions might be associated with them and the like. But I guess you know, stepping up um, to a higher level, uh, there's, there's really a lot of scope for innovation here. And, and one of the things that's attractive about the Android uh, sort of vision is that, uh, that things should be much more open. And uh, so there should be the freedom for people to uh, sort of choose the kind of phone that really works well for them instead of you know, dealing with some palette of alternatives provided for them by the uh, providers. But as you move into the hardware stuff, obviously there are a lot of costs and other kinds of issues that begin resurfacing. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, you know, in, increased innovation in that, in that space. I think there are lots and lots of interesting possibilities. Any thoughts from anybody? I think the bottom line is what you said, that there is a lot of space for innovation in that space, and it's really nice to see what comes out. Mm -hmm. But the, the, that, the cell phone UI clearly needs innovation. It's crying out for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I actually haven't been willing to uh, enter into an exclusive agreement. And so the iPhone was not something that I all I could do, but I, I did get an iPod Touch, which, as, as I'm sure you know, shares many features with it, and it's 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 quite interesting. Uh, so you know, probably most of you have played with it, and you know that you know the resolution control has some sort of nice things about it. On the other hand, I mean, you've probably been struck as I have that it it's really not quite right. You know, clever as it is, because you expand your view of one thing, and then you go look at something else, and you're back to microscopic again. And then you again have to say, no, you know, if I'm going to read this. And you know, there are reasons for that having to do with you know, the difference between scanning and reading detail and so on. But yeah, there's, 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 there's definitely a lot, to, uh, a lot to explore in that, in that broad area. Anything else on anybody's mind? 
Well, thank you very much. If any of you want to uh, say hello one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be happy to do that. But uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>